I'm delighted to be joined by Mr. Nikhil Seth, the United Nations Assistant Secretary General and Executive Director of the United Nations Institute uh, for Training and Research, UNITAR. Uh, hello, Nikhil. Hello, John. It's a pleasure to be with you today. OK, and thank you. Thank you for joining us. Uh, could you briefly explain the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and their importance in creating a more sustainable world? I was at the heart of the development of the Sustainable Development Goals, John, so being brief is going to be difficult, but I need to capture all this in a nutshell. And what I'd like to say is that the Sustainable Development Goals, which are enshrined in the 2030 Agenda, are a utopian vision of the world which we want to get to by 2030 without poverty, without hunger, with universal health care, with sustainable energy for all, with water, with sustainable cities, sustainable infrastructure, protection of the climate system, and peaceful and just societies. These are all enshrined in the goals and targets contained in the SDGs. These were adopted in September of 2015, almost six years ago. And it was a euphoric moment when we saw almost 170 heads of state and government, academia, business, civil society contributing to this great achievement. They all contributed to the conceptualization of this agenda, and we are hoping that everybody engages in its implementation. At the heart of the SDGs is a rather simple but powerful promise to leave no one behind anywhere. And uh, these bringing together the four pillars on which sustainability rests, which is the economic pillar, the social pillar, the environmental pillar, and the pillar for creating peaceful and just societies. Sometimes it's complex to understand all these goals. So let me uh, summarize them as five transitions that the world desperately needs today. One is a transition in health systems. Second is a transition in agriculture and food systems. Third is a complete transformation of energy systems. Fourth is a transformation of the finance industry. And finally, a transformation of education. These are the five or six big transitions which are part of the SDGs and what we desperately need to get to the world we want. Thank you, John. Yeah, wow, it's, it's what so wide ranging and, and, and should and will affect all our lives in, in the future. But perhaps as a chartered engineer, I'm specifically interested in how do you see engineers and engineering's role in helping to achieve those goals? Engineers shape the world and engineering affects almost every aspect of our lives. The impact of engineering ranges from providing clean water and ensuring stable food supply through providing reliable, affordable energy and the infrastructure that enables the world's population to live in cities. And in the next 20 years, 70% of our world will be living in cities to drive climate change mitigation and on innovations and new technology. Engineering contributes to ensuring healthy lives and well-being for all through the design, the manufacturing, the distribution, the installation, the commissioning, and, uh, and the, the disposal of healthcare products. Engineering skills have been critical in response, for example, you know, to this pandemic for developing and supplying PPE, for rapid, rapid setup and equipping of emergency hospitals, breathing equipment, scaling up production of vaccinations, all these things have required the knowledge and skill of engineers and technicians. The way in which individual engineers make professional judgments and carry out engineering work makes a huge difference to the impact of their work. Good engineering is not only about technical competence and applying the correct principles, but understanding the wider impact your work will have. Agriculture is the biggest user of water worldwide. And I would like to give you a little example here from drip irrigation, which I've seen implemented in many of the states in India. It was a technology developed in a kibbutz in Israel, and it's now available to millions of farmers. But was it only an engineering problem? No, it was not only an engineering problem, but it involved finance because we had to speak to 
give loans to farmers. Now there are millions using it, but you have to get them to accept the new technology. Second, we had to speak to agricultural extension services because it meant new kinds of seed, new kinds of pesticides. So this exchange between finance, between banks, between agricultural extension services, and the engineers who were developing this gravitational-based drip irrigation system was crucial in its adaptation, adoption, and wide dissemination in India. So you see the role of the engineer here, and I see one of your principles is to seek multiple views to solve sustainability challenges. And here's an example to show that without this, millions of farmers in India today wouldn't be using drip irrigation. Oh, thank you, Nikhil. That's fascinating and a fantastic example of, of what we, we try and achieve as engineers. Um, we're in, in the Engineering Council, we, we, we value and we feel competence and, and commitment from engineers is, is, is very important. But perhaps in what ways do you think internationally recognised standards of competence and commitment could encourage or support good engineering practices, both perhaps locally and globally? Well, standards of competence and commitment set a bar for skills, for knowledge, for experience and behaviours, which is very important, that shape an engineer's practice. These standards define the breadth and depth of skills and knowledge engineers and technicians need to be effective. A focus on competence promotes the acquisition of skills and knowledge in both formal and informal ways. Standards provide an external reference point and having an independent standard created by the engineering profession and community goes beyond what is just legally required and supports individuals' practice and helps raise the bar for engineering in general. So there are several ways in which uh, setting the bar through standards is very important. And engineering's impact is huge, and it has the potential to create significant negative impacts if not carried out competently or in a not so ethical and not sustainable way. Air pollution, for example, from transport, industry, and domestic energy affects our climate, of course, but also our health. And achieving greater efficiency can have a huge impact on cutting emissions and mitigating climate change. These are often low cost. And here I give the example of coal-fired turbines. The cost of making them efficient, uh, the costs are minimal, but with little improvements, you can have dramatic reduction in emissions. This is an engineering challenge, but it's important to get the finance available to make these efficiency uh, changes in the coal-fired electricity industry. So these are ways in which uh, people with appropriate skills and knowledge can bring in efficiency in energy. energy. Engineers who aren't fully competent may inadvertently create negative impacts on safety, on issues of the well-being of people. And it's important that they have the support of professional standards and ideally of a professional network like yours, which can support them and guide them this is one of the benefits of membership of a professional engineering institution. Assessment against standards for professional registration verifies that an individual can meet the engineering and technological needs of today, while also anticipating the needs of and impact on future generations. And that's very important because, uh, you know, the Brundtland Commission in the late 70s in 1978, actually defined sustainability as meeting the needs of present generations without compromising the needs of future generations. And this is essentially a very important engineering task. How do you use natural resources? How do you use this whole concept of a circular economy to be able to meet the needs of future generations? Yeah. I think, uh, I mean, Nico, you've, you've really highlighted the importance of sustainability in those sort of last few uh, comments, but how would you respond to those perhaps in the industry who see sustainability as an add-on and not a, and, or a nice to have that's not core to engineering? Well, our natural resource base is depleting most rapidly. And as people have said so often, we have no planet B. 
we have to look at ways in which our only little planet and its finite resources can do what I mentioned before, meet needs for the present and for the future. And given all this, it will be in, in, irresponsible, I think, and unethical to use our resources that deprives our children and our grandchildren. So those who say that sustainability is an add-on, we had a lot of that talk, for example, in the finance industry or in business in general, where they said that all issues relating to sustainability uh, and there was some tokenism by the appointment of sustainability officers who weren't really mainstreamed into business, but that is changing. And I was looking only at a recent issue of The Guardian, which talks a lot about how the finance industry has changed in Wall Street, in the very big companies like BlackRock. Green investing has become the norm. So that has to be the norm which guides and directs the engineering profession too. And the efficient and effective use of resources is something we are all responsible for. But engineers who have such an important impact have a particular responsibility to minimize adverse impact and maximize potential benefit. Thank you. I think during that, that response, you know, you mentioned uh, guidance as, as well, and uh, you know, that's what we're partly looking at uh, today. But what do you think is the role of guidance in encouraging engineering for sustainable development? You know, before uh, talking to you, John, I had a look at all the principles that you have enshrined in the fourth edition of uh, the specs you've created. And I was very, they're a bit generic, yes, but uh, they're a very good guide to ways in which engineers need to think of uh, what the work they are about to set out to do. And the decisions they're about to make, which are going to have such a profound impact on sustainability. And by encouraging people in the engineering profession to consider sustainable development and giving a framework to support their thinking and action, Professional standards and guidance can contribute to a shift in the types of solutions they offer to their clients and customers. I gave you one example of drip irrigation, but across the board, if you look at infrastructure, you look at sustainable cities, you look at transport, you look at energy, you look at water, you look at agriculture, there are tremendous ways in which engineers can collectively, with the multi-stakeholder kind of engagement, come up with practical solutions. The challenge for today, for getting to the SDGs, is actually a scaling up. We need to reach people not in the thousands or tens of thousands, but in the millions. And that's where standards and guidance can be extremely useful, especially for engineers. Uh, another principle is doing more than just complying with codes and legislation. Yes, we think that you know, having acquired the degree uh, having done the necessary schooling and education uh, and being conforming with codes and regulations, that's it. What else is expected of us? But now is the time our world needs individuals, engineers, everyone to think a little beyond and go beyond formal and technical knowledge to, uh, for the benefit of uh, humankind. Uh, wow, thank you. Nikhil, Really, for the last minute, I've probably saved the easiest question, and that's uh, what do you think is the impact for society if the UN SDGs are, are not being achieved? We are in a very dire situation, John. Uh, the COVID-19 crisis has really set back SDG achievement, and we are way behind on every goal and every target, and we are entering a very critical period. Now, what I would like to say in this, that the SDGs are a wonderful blueprint to show us the way out. And SDGs don't belong to some distant government or some distant big corporation. They actually belong to each one of us. And each individual, each engineer, each uh, professional has to look at how to internalize the SDGs and make them a part of their daily life. The decisions we make, on the cars we buy, on the way we treat women, on every aspect of the SDGs can be really converted into a personal SDG agenda. And that's what I would urge engineers to do. Okay. Nikhil, thank you for your, your time and your support uh, today. It is, it is very much appreciated. Thank you. Great pleasure, John, and bye-bye.